now six months pregnant, was in Chicago doing a play with Steppenwolf called Love Letters. She's just getting after it. <laughs> <laughs> in multiple phone calls, we discussed what we should name our son. One day, the name became clear to me. I called up Moira. We should call him Mac after your brother. Moira was thrilled. Boyd McKenna Mac Harris, the Vietnam vet, Silver Star recipient, West Point instructor, passed away in 1983 of cancer. We all thought of him regularly. When our son was born on November 10th, 1990, almost two years to the day after Sophie, we named him McKenna Anthony Sinise Mac for short. The Irish and Italian influences surrounded us and sounded very American. Uh, and, and after Mac is born... You know, you go, and I'm, I'm not going to read this part because people should read it for themselves, but you kind of talk about just how everything kind of hits you that you got these two beautiful children. You got, you know, you're doing well in life. You've got the beautiful family. And you say here, you know, you're driving while this is happening and, and you get emotional. You say, as I brushed away the tears at the stoplight, I think I whispered, whispered a semblance of my first prayer. The prayer was hazy, but the intention was clear. Called a longing, perhaps. The first twinges of belief. Two words layered with more than one meaning. Thank you. Um, you wrap up Grapes of Wrath on stage. And you say here, I search for what to do next. I knew I wanted to do something epic. Something that moved people. Preferably another movie. But what? Then Elaine Steinbeck, and you talk about where you developed this relationship with her. Uh, and Elaine, she, she was married to John Steinbeck, his, you, his widow. Yeah. She controlled all the rights to his material. And, and you knew her. Where would you know her from? From, 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 from working from, on The Grapes of Wrath. She gave us the rights to do it, and she loved the production, so she, we became friends. And so uh, Elaine had become a real champion of Steppenwolf. She'd seen that we could take on her husband's novels and handle the stories really well. On the last day of shooting the PBS version of Grapes of Wrath, I stood with Elaine during a break out by the theater's back steps. I thought about the boxcar image, swallowed, sucked up by my courage, and said, Elaine, would you give me the rights to Of Mice and Men? I'd like to try and make a movie out of it. I paused and added tentatively, I'd need your help too because I don't have any money. She chuckled quietly, smiled her beautiful, delight, dignified smile, and said, well, honey, it's already been a film. Three times. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Uh, you end up making the deal. She eventually gives it to you. She gives it to you free of charge, by the way, which is, shows you that she uh, was impressed with you and what you, know, you, what you guys had done with uh, her, other, her husband's other material. Um, you start, you make this movie, you're doing the, and actually the day the LA riots touched off, I was mixing the sound for Of Mice and Men at Sony Studios in Culver City. One of the technicians called me into the office and there on his TV, all hell was breaking loose. For the next five days while the riots raged, I tried to work at home while watching the city burn on television. Those are, of course, the Rodney King riots. Um... You get another uh, another invite to Cannes. It's it's can. Oh, okay, sorry. Did I mention <laughs> something about me being uncultured? It's con. <laughs> you know, it's French. Yeah. All right, so you get another invite to Cannes. <laughs> you, you say it how you want to say. It. Hey, I'm American. There's an S on the end of it. So you get another invite to con. Oh, there you go. And. On the, way, on the way from the hotel to the theater, the streets were lined with cheering people. At the theater, the red carpet was packed with paparazzi and journalists. Everybody wore tuxedos or ball gowns. Flash bulbs popped everywhere. As a filmmaker, when your movie is being shown, you can't stand in the back and pace, which is what I nervously felt like doing. You must sit in the middle of the theater along with the production team in the middle of a gigantic crowd. You hope the crowd enjoys the show. If they don't, then you sit there and take your punishment, even if you get booed. And this was my first film as a producer, my second as a director, only my third as an actor. The crowd w and I watched the movie. It started just as I had envisioned it, on a train inside a boxcar. We heard the clickety-clack of the train going across the tracks. The story progressed. The movie finished. The credits rolled with the lights still down. The plot concludes tragically. 
not triumphantly, and it's not a movie where you walk away feeling happy. Still, the story is deeply moving and powerful, and my hope was that after seeing the film, viewers might be motivated to do a little more and make sure people aren't alone, abandoned, marginalized, or left on the fringes. When the credits began to roll, a little lull kept in, crept into the auditorium, a tense moment of silence. Sometimes the audience waits until the very end of the credits to show their feelings. Sometimes they make their decision with the credits still rolling. I felt my skin crawl. Will the audience clap? Will they boo? I held my breath waiting for the response. And then it happened. A dam burst. The entire room erupted into applause, huge applause. When the credits still rolling, the audience clapped and clapped. One person stood, then another. The entire theater rose to their feet. A standing ovation. The team and I stayed in the middle of the crowd, and they brought the house lights up and shined a spotlight on us. The crowd continued to clap wildly. They cheered through the entire credits. Malkovich and I stood, took a bow and waved. The credits ended, and nothing appeared on the screen. The audience continued to clap and cheer. Malkovich and I sat down and took a few moments. The audience continued to clap and cheer. Then Russ, John, and I stood, and I saw Tom Selleck standing off to one side in the crowd. I I had to leave this in there for Echo Charles. I saw Tom Selleck standing off to one side of the crowd, clapping, cheering. I didn't know him personally, but I could put out his familiar face anywhere. He wore a white tux, and as I glanced over, Tom caught my eye and smiled and nodded as only Magnum P.I. could do. (laughs) The standing ovation went on and on. The noise in the room was deafening. Someone said later the ovation lasted a full 10 minutes. Finally, the clapping wound down, and I stood again in the crowd, to the, called the crowd, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Tears filled my eye, eyes. A wave of emotion nearly choked me. We had worked hard, and this was our moment of truth. It felt spectacular. And there's a little, I'm not going to go into the full thing, but there's a, Russ is with you. And, Russ was a co-producer. And Russ me. says, uh, wow, I'm so glad the MGM executives are here to see this. It will no. be really good for the film. Or is that you said I, that? I said that. Okay, so you said, oh yeah, yeah. I looked over at Russ and quipped, wow, I'm so glad the MGM executives are here to see this. It will be really good for the film. And then he says back, either that or I think we just made a French film. <laughs> which means that's like an artistic film. Art house. Dude. An art house art film. House. Which is cool. But not super, what, profitable? Not, not a lot of people are going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like you were kind of right. Kind of? I was. You were right. Um, going here, the execs, I mean, this is the exact, what company made this? or what, what, what MGM. What, the execs, the MGM execs considered it an artistic success, but I think they suspected the movie wasn't going to make much money, so they weren't going to spend much to market it. Columbia's A River Runs Through It, starring Brad Pitt and directed by Robert Redford. <laughs> he started, I'm starting to get hostile towards this guy. <laughs> no, <man. laughs> Came out seven days after Of Mice and Men, and although the stories were different, the heart tone, Heartland tone was similar. A River Runs Through It went on to win an Oscar and earn $43 million. Of Mice and Men received a 10-minute standing ovation at Con, but grossed just over $5 million. So, yeah, bittersweet. You know, but uh, I'll tell you, I, 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 say, I say in the book, I have no um, – I, I was disappointed. Obviously, I wanted them to put full-page ads in the paper and do a lot more promotion on it. But the bottom line is that they gave me $8.8 million to make that movie, to make a mice. And nobody thought of Mice and Men was going to be a big blockbuster or anything like that. But they gave me the money to make it, and they left me alone pretty much when I was making it to make my own decisions and do what I want. So I'm very grateful to MGM and Alan Ladd and the people there who supported it, even though it wasn't a big hit. When you see the movie now, you made the movie that you wanted to make, right? Yeah. You don't look at it now and go, oh, I should have done this, or I should have done that? Now, no, no, you know, I, uh, I haven't seen it for quite, quite a, a long time, but the last time I saw it was with a small group of folks, and I felt like the movie holds up. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's sort of a timeless story, mm-hmm. you know, and the way it's made is not, there's no filmmaking technique that happened to be the the, the 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 fad at the time and or anything like that it's shot very straightforward it's pretty to look at the it's about the acting and the story is good and uh, so uh for that reason i think it holds up and i've i've received countless letters 
from high school kids all over the country for the last 30 years because they, they study of mice and men in school and then they watch the movie. And so more kids have seen that movie than ever saw it in the theater <laughs> when it opened. Where, where can people see it right now? Is it on Netflix? It's, it probably is and DVDs and that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, Netflix. Are they still making DVDs, Echo? I don't. Don't they? <laughs> have those. Numbers. You don't know anything about that. <laughs> better, that thing better you be on You don't know what iTunes. that is. <laughs> that thing better be on. Well, people are going to go watch it now. Um, it's a good movie. Yeah. And Malkovich is, uh, is in it. Uh, we play George and Lenny, and it's a, it's a good movie. I'm proud of it. Six weeks before the opening of Mice and Men, our third child was due. Born August 20th, 1992. Ella was our smallest baby. And two weeks after, the, after her birth... We sat at an appointment with our pediatrician. She listened to Ella's little heart and said, I want you to go see a cardiologist right away. There's something odd in Ella's heartbeat. I tell you, when a pediatrician says that, your life clouds with fear. So you guys take her to the cardiologist. They run all kinds of tests. They find out that she's got some issues. And they say that she's, they want to see what happens over time. She's got some holes in her heart, um, but sometimes the holes close up on their own, and they want to see what's going to happen. Like, and when I say they want to see what's going to happen, it's a years that they want to wait. Yeah, yeah. Are you sweating the entire time? Are you constantly in fear? Um, no, because we would have regular appointments with the cardiologist, got it. and he would just he would just listen and see. Eventually, and they would, uh, you know, take pictures and, and uh, look at what happened. Eventually, when she was five years old, uh, there were three holes when she was born in her heart. Two of them closed up by the time she was five years old. And the, the last one, the biggest of the three, they said, it's not going to close on its own. You, we're going to have to do surgery on it. So that... that now we're dealing with our little five-year-old having heart surgery, and that that then it was it was scary. Yeah, it was just, but these heart surgeons are they're they're remarkable, and we had a remarkable heart surgeon who took very good care of her, and she was home within two days, I think, of the surgery, and you know she's perfect. Uh, at, about five years later, we took you know we had to take her to the cardiologist. He kept checking. Five years later, we went in. She's about 10 years old, and he said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is everything's good. Your heart's great. The bad news is you don't have to see me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we stopped taking her, and she's a beautiful, beautiful girl, married now, and you know, our, our little baby. Um, yeah, on the backdrop of that, I had to th- I had to, I couldn't I couldn't not read this part. In the fall of 1992, my agent set up a general meeting for me to sit down with Steven Spielberg. As a director and producer, Steven Spielberg was already legendary having pulled off a string of blockbusters including Jaws. <laughs> which I could just stop right there because anybody that knows me knows that when I was a kid, uh videotape machines had just come out <clears throat> and w- my dad got a videotape machine and we had so, like, we probably had three movies on videotape. Oh, one of them was Jaws. We watched that continually for years. We call those VCRs. We don't say. Oh, videotape, videotape machines. machines, right? Okay. We don't say that. Video cassette recorder. Yeah. VCR. Yeah, VCR. Yeah. Yeah. So we had that. Right. So, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T., the extraterrestrial. Steven asked me what I was doing. I told him about Of Mice and Men. He said, oh, I'd love to see it. Will you show it to me? Just bring it over to my house. I've got a screening room there. We'll watch it together. And I said, uh, of course. We set up the screening just outside the theater in Steven's house. He had a little lobby with a popcorn machine and a candy counter. His wife, Kate Capshaw, joined us. And we all grabbed some popcorn and sodas and sat down to watch Of Mice and Men together. It was surreal. Stephen and Kate were both very gracious. They loved the movie. Afterward, we stood outside their home saying our goodbyes. Kate gave me a little hug, and Stephen turned to me while I racked my brain. Think, Gary, think. I was desperate to ask Stephen one brilliant question. But all I could muster was, Stephen, how do you know where to put the camera? He chuckled and said, I just watch a lot of movies. (laughs) So simple, 
so profound to become a great filmmaker you must study the greats you learn to steal you learn and steal from people you admire over the years